Whenever I give a presentation like this or I listen to a podcast, I always like when the presenter tells me a little bit about themselves. And so I thought that's what I'd do today, give you a little bit more insight into who I am and why I'm up here speaking to you today. And to do that, I've got this great pictorial map of the United States to help us through that. And I'm going to start right in the very beginning. I was born in the great state of Iowa. Both my parents are Hawkeyes. Both my parents went to the University of Iowa. And both my parents did what many people in Iowa did that lived there in the late 1970s. They got the heck out of Iowa, and they moved to someplace far warmer. Uh, I grew up in Tempe, Arizona. I spent all of my formative years in Arizona from the time I was six months of age all the way through high school. As was mentioned, I then went to college in the Bay Area. And then, as was also mentioned, I took my first job in retail at The Gap. I started my career at The Gap in the late 90s in San Francisco. Spent four years there, mostly in inventory planning and allocation type roles. I then went to business school, and then after business school, I decided to get back into retail. And particularly, I decided to get back into merchandising or buying. And that's when I linked up with Target. And believe it or not, my first job at Target, this is always a, it's always a fun one, was as the buyer of seasonal bath and rugs. <laughs> yeah, good. That's as kitschy as it sounds, believe me. It's things like pumpkin-shaped doormats, Santa Claus hand towels. I always joke it's my grandmother's favorite job that I ever had. Uh, I did a number of different merchandising since at Target. I ran frozen food for a period of time after that. I ran the baby department as well. But the next most important thing that happened to me happened in 2007, because that's when I met my now wife on a trip to Las Vegas. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, Tom, I see the grin on your face. That's a story for a different time. Maybe after this is over, we can tell that story. But the reason I bring it up, the reason it's important is we met, we dated, and we actually got married long distance. It wasn't until 2011 that we came together to start our family. My wife got this great job offer in Boulder, Colorado, and I said to Target at the time, I said, hey, Target, look, I'm married. At some point, I have to go live with my wife. It's just something I need to do. We want to start a family. And Target was really great. They said, well, Chris, if that's how you feel, why don't you go learn how to run stores? And so that's what I did. In fact, I jumped at the chance. I ended up running my own super Target just south of Boulder, Colorado for a period of time. And then I ended up running a district of 12 stores spread across the glamorous locales of Northern Calif Colorado, excuse me, uh, Wyoming, Western Nebraska, and Western South Dakota. I was in my car about 30,000 miles a year, and there I was, 34, 35-year-old Harvard MBA, bagging groceries and throwing freight off a truck many days of the week. My family would come in during the holidays, see me working at Checkland, and think I'd lost my freaking mind. But I got to tell you, had I not done that experience, I honestly don't think I'd be up here talking to you today. It was the single best decision I ever made in my career. It gave me the chance to see retail from a whole other vantage point. All right, then as luck would have it, 2013, we actually moved back to Minneapolis, and I was named the vice president of home furnishings for Target.com. Soon after, I became Target's first omni-channel merchant, and by that I mean I was the first uh, merchant that piloted joint P&L responsibility for stores and .com at the same time. Target later went to that structure corporate-wide about two years later, and then I finished out my career heading up a project called The Store of the Future, which was essentially this. Target came to me and said, Chris, based on your very unique set of, your very unique background, Help us answer a question. Five to 10 years out, why are people still coming to physical stores to shop? And how would you conceive of the Target brand in trying to answer that question? I spent two years designing Target's future operation for scale. And that question, how will stores continue to evolve, is what still inspires me to this day. When that project ended in 2017, my now business partner, Ann Mazinga, and I, and I had met on that work at Target, we got together and we started our own media company devoted fully to the further study of that question, how will stores of the future continue to evolve? So we started OmniTalk, it's our media company. And OmniTalk's beginnings were quite humble, let me tell you. It started with me writing an article in a coffee shop comparing Amazon to the Vietnam War. The next thing I knew, people were reading it. I started writing articles every week after that. People started reading those. I became a contributor for Forbes. And then Ann and I got into video and podcast production as well, which I'll talk about here in a second. All told now, I think we have 40,000 people uh, following us each and every week, and I've had about 4 million people read my articles on Forbes at this point. Um, our job at OmniTalk is pretty straightforward. It's, it's our job to focus on the people, the companies, and the technologies that we think are shaping the future of retail. I'm not a consultant. I don't consult in any way. I get asked that a lot. We are just two people that love retail and think we can provide a more nuanced perspective on what's happening in the business than, say, your average journalist. And we're also, hopefully, as you can see from this presentation already, two people that love what we do. This is our motto. 
Follow your interests and you'll always be interested. It was first said to me by my mentor at Target, who's now the CEO of Dollar Shave Club. And it comes through most clearly in this, which is this is our weekly podcast called the OmniTalk Fast Five. And the gist of the OmniTalk Fast Five podcast is that Ann and I, each and every week, we sit down and we select the five headlines from the past week that we think are most indicative of where the future of retail is headed. And then we debate them. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we disagree, and at the end of the day, we hope, for, we hope it makes for really good content. And so when Silk came to me and said, hey, why don't you come and present in our Boston event, I said, I'd love to, and I've got just the idea. I want to take the same format that we do in our weekly podcast, but I want to broaden it out. Instead of looking at the last week, let's look at the past year, and let's double our pleasure, and let's give you, five head let's give you 10 headlines instead of five. But before I do that, before I get to the headlines, I do want to set the table on a few concepts. First, I want to talk about why do stores exist in general? Okay, spend some time there. I'll take this slide to my grave, but stores exist, whether digitally or physically, if you think about it, for five key reasons. They can be one, a place of inspiration, two, a means of convenience, three, a source of immediate gratification, and then fourth and fifth, these points are very important. Fourth is this idea I call taction. And by that I mean the ability to touch and feel products, to do all the sensory aspects that give us confidence in the purchases that we're making. Best examples I can give you are thinking like touching your avocados in a grocery store or trying clothes on in a fitting room. That's taction. And then of course stores are inherently a social experience. There's something we can do either on our own or with other people. The other thing I want to touch on is that retail is actually a pretty big creature of habit particularly on the innovation side of things. If you look at the timeline on the screen, every 30 to 40 years, retail innovation cycles like clockwork. Some new big innovation comes along that changes the dynamics of how things work. You can trace it all the way back to the 1800s. I'll spare you that historical dissertation. As Tom reminded me, I was a history major, which I had almost forgot about in presenting this speech. But I'll just go back to the 1950s. What happened then? Late 1950s, first indoor shopping mall, which is actually one mile from where I live in Minneapolis, Southdale Shopping Mall. And then in 1962, coincidentally, you had Target, Walmart, and Kmart all starting in the same year. I call that period of time the mass productization of America. Essentially, large amounts of goods were made available and more conveniently to consumers than ever before. But of course, as we all know, that came with a cost, right? The cost was retailers could still only carry what they could inside their four walls, and for the most part, your average Walmart experience looked the same in Bentonville, Arkansas, as it did throughout the rest of the country, from New Jersey all the way to California. But then, of course, digital came along in the 90s, the next big 30-year innovation. Digital by way of eBay, Amazon, and others, later supercharged by the mobile phone around 2007. Digital came in the world and said, you know what? Those first three things that used to solely be the purview of physical stores, you physical stores, we can do those as well, if not better, than you can. And for the most part, if you stop and think about it, they can. Convenience. Amazon's the everything store. You can have anything you want at the push of a button. Assortments aren't bounded by the physical four walls. Media gratification. You can have anything you want in as little as 15 minutes or less nowadays if you're willing to pay for it. But the most important point that separates a digital from a physical experience, in my opinion right now, is inspiration. A digital experience is 100% personalized to us as individuals. I go home today, I shop on my desktop, my mobile phone, my experience won't look like anyone else's in this room, let alone in the world. And that's not something we can say about physical stores, at least not yet. Which also brings up another question. If you buy this timeline and you buy the adage that history repeats itself, it implies that we're due. We're due for that next big innovation in the cycle. And it's my contention, or my hypothesis, that that next big innovation is already in market. And it's the last headline I'm gonna share with you today. All right, so with that tease of all tease, let's borrow from David Letterman here, and let's get to the top 10 list. All right, headline number 10. How we search is changing. A Google exec revealed recently that more Gen Zs and millennials are searching for restaurants via TikTok and Instagram than ever before, and it's starting to hurt Google's business. Now, why is that revelation relevant to retail? Because it hits on this idea called social commerce. This is the most important slide I have in the entire deck. This isn't the first time you're gonna see it either. 
It comes from a friend of mine named Carter Jensen. Carter used to work with us at Omnitalk. He now works at General Mills. And what Carter did is really brilliant. He took the idea of social commerce and he put it on a horizontal line. The best way to think about this horizontal line is think of a commerce marketplace on one end, like Amazon's marketplace, great example. Or on the other end, you have a social network. Think TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. Whoever can control that line end to end has a tremendous advantage when it comes to understanding their customers. I'll tell you what I mean. Take Facebook. Facebook knows everything I like, everything I comment on, every event I attend. Facebook probably actually knows how long it takes me to scroll past certain pictures of ex-girlfriends from high school relative to others. I hate to admit it, but Facebook, as we all know, probably knows more about ourselves than we do. Google and Amazon know what we explicitly tell it, but a social network like Facebook or TikTok knows our implicit desires as well. And it's that combination of knowing us implicitly and explicitly as consumers along this connected line of commerce that makes the Google execs revelation so powerful. Because when you get right down to it, what the slide implies is that how we consume everything, content, products, is changing right before our very eyes. And all the big guys want to capitalize on it. Facebook's been going after it for years. They've been fortifying Instagram shopping, devoting a ton of resources to their Facebook marketplace, albeit if you read recent reports, not to a ton of success. TikTok, Google by way of YouTube also want their hand at it. And last but not least, over in the corner, Amazon. Amazon's Thursday night football package is designed to approximate the very same idea and in a way that should give Amazon first party data that would put Nielsen to shame. All right, so now I get to the point where, you know, most of the time the retailers and the audience are saying, okay, that's great, Chris, but I don't have a social network. What am I to do? How am I supposed to respond? Well, that's where headline number nine comes into play, which is about live streaming. There's been a lot of hullabaloo in the media right now about this concept called live stream commerce. In fact, probably too much so. Companies like TikTok and Instagram have been having a devil of a time getting it off the ground in the United States. And yet, conversely, Walmart just last month announced that they're diving headfirst in the deep end of the live streaming pool. So why the difference? Well, to me, the difference comes down to two things. One, understanding how we shop as American consumers. And then two, also understanding the difference in definitions between live streaming and shoppable video. In our minds, we like to think of live streaming as some new modern day incarnation of like the QVC or home shopping network like you guys see here, mixed together or mashed up with TikTok and Instagram. It's my opinion that's the wrong way to think about it. It could be partly that, but that idea in and of itself misses the bigger picture. The bigger picture is that 90% of US commerce still happens on a retailer's or brand's own website, which is important to think about because what that implies is that the most important thing then is to have our videos shoppable and available on our websites or available wherever our consumers happen to get inspired by them. And that content can be either recorded or played live, it doesn't matter. The important point is that it's shoppable. Unlike in China, where most of, their con most of their commerce is happening through social media platforms, but China, you have to realize too, has a different starting point for commerce overall, especially mobile commerce. Here's a great example, Fresh Market. And here it is again, too, on their homepage. If you guys want to, you can check it out, take out your mobile phones, check out exactly what I'm talking about right now. Just go to the freshmarket.com. Um, you can see how this works, and I'll point Point your attention specifically to what's in that right-hand corner. That's the ethos of what Walmart's trying to do too. And in fact, that headline where it talked about Walmart live streaming is actually doing Walmart a disservice because what Walmart's really doing is trying to make their videos shoppable. So the idea is that the fresh market, Walmart, anyone can take this content and make it shoppable. Again, they can play it back recorded, they can play it live, but the idea is, is that it's available on the websites at the moment of inspiration to drive conversion. That's the most important factor at play here. The other great piece about that from an autonomy perspective is the retailers can then control that content, own it themselves, and then farm it out to whatever social media network they want whenever they want to, thereby gaining control of how their brand is positioned along that line of commerce that I just referenced before. Not the sec this is the second time you guys have seen this slide too. This is also 
why this is so important, because this is shoppable video potentially on steroids. Coincidentally, the very same day that Amazon just announced they're gonna do Black Friday football in 2023. All right, you follow this logic chain through, an, another pattern starts to emerge. And that pattern is that what we mean when we say direct to consumer or going direct is also changing, particularly from the vantage points of the CPGs or the manufacturers with whom the retailers work. The best example of that, in this headline, Unilever recently announced that it plans to sell Ben & Jerry's quote unquote direct through Instacart. Here's what that looks like. Ben & Jerry's, right on Instacart, they have a page dedicated to it. You as a consumer go onto the site, you shop, you pick what you want, and you can have it delivered from any number of local grocery outlets. Here's another example. This is Keto, Ratio Keto Yogurt, which is owned by General Mills. Here, General Mills is trying to approximate the very same idea you just saw with Ben & Jerry's and Instacart, only they're doing this from, their, from Ratio Keto's own website. But it fundamentally works the same way. You go on, you can shop it however you want, and then you can pick from the local grocer from which you most, are most comfortable with purchasing the item. You go back to what I said in the last headline, though, you can see that this gives the CPGs just as much autonomy and the ability to put their content out however they want to capture the consumer at the moment of inspiration and drive them to purchase to the point where in these, both these examples, the retailer is almost an afterthought. The retail is, not, the retail is nothing more than a fulfillment node at this point. So you go back to this slide, what it shows you is that the digital landscape particularly is 100% a battleground built along this concept between the social media networks, the retailers, and the CPGs. All right, enough about social commerce. Let's get to the brass tacks of good omnichannel retailing. Let's start talking some physical stores, which is more of my specialty anyway. For that, I'm gonna go to headline number seven, which is Target recently announced earlier this year that they plan to offer Starbucks as part of their curbside pickup offering, right? Yeah, sounds pretty good, huh? <laughs> uh, I, bring this, I bring this headline up for a couple reasons. One, it highlights the importance of curbside pickup coming out of the pandemic, which I think has been talked about ad nauseum, so I'm not gonna belabor that point. But the other reason I bring it up is because what Target is trying to do here is really, really difficult. Here are some of the reasons that it's much more difficult than one would think that I came up with. One, Target's a multi-category retailer. It carries everything from frozen food to home furnishings. Two, Target stages product for ship from store, buy online pickup store, pickup in store, and curbside pickup. Three different disposition types. Starbucks is in and of itself another retailer, which if you've ever been involved in that type of work, means a whole host of item data integration work, which is never fun and is never easy. And then the last two points, which are my favorite, if you've ever used the Starbucks mobile app, you'll realize that the mobile shopping experience for a cup of coffee looks far different than the mobile shopping experience for general merchandise. Partly why this probably hasn't rolled out yet either. And then last but not least, my favorite reason on the board, people are pretty damn particular about their coffee, far more particular than they are about their getting the right box of Kraft macaroni and cheese or the right DiGiorno frozen pizza, especially if they're on their way into work. So with all that said, it asks the bigger question again, which is how does Target or any retailer for that matter have the guts or the temerity to think that they can do something like this? It's not gonna be easy, right? Well, for that, I went to one of my favorite sources to get the answer, and that was Sam's Club. Sam's Club, if you follow them like I do, uh, is probably barring Amazon the most innovative retailer in the United States, uh, and they have been for the past 10 or 15 years. They've been pushing the gas pedal on innovation for a long time now, for example, they had Scan and Go in all their stores, Scan and Go shopping in all their stores since 2016, four years before the pandemic was even a glint in our eye. And so over the past few years, I've had the chance to interview their CEO, their chief product officer, but one interview in particular stood out to me, and that was when I interviewed this man, Vinod Bidarkupa, their CTO. And I asked Vinod point blank, I said, Vinod, how is it that you guys go so fast? How do you keep pushing the envelope on innovation? And Vinod, to his credit, he answered me directly, which almost no retailer ever does. And I can understand why, I was in their chair, like they wanna be cautious of what they say. But Vinod, to his credit, he said, Chris, the number one technology that helps us go fast is a cloud point of sale system. Cloud point of sale is 1A, followed by cloud order management system 1B. 
And from my experience at Target, he's 100% correct. To succeed in this new era of omni-channel, on-demand retailing, we have to have a real-time understanding of our sales and our inventory at all times. It's what's gonna separate the haves from the have-nots in the future of retail. And I think what you're seeing already is the companies that have invested in that space are doing well relative to others. All right, now I wanna touch on this topic called micro-warehousing. Um, uh, some people also call it dark storing. Uh, I could have picked any number of uh, headlines to highlight here. Uh, I chose this one because I thought it was pretty germane to what we've already discussed, which is DoorDash's movement into creating little mini warehouses throughout the country. And they're doing that for two reasons. One, they're doing that because DoorDash itself wants to become a retailer. So it wants to start selling products directly to consumers through these micro warehousing sites. And then also, as we just talked about in headline number eight, I believe, um, I had the chance to interview their chief revenue officer at a trade show recently on stage, and he told me that they're also planning to offer micro warehousing as a service for the CPG brands to create exactly what we just talked about. The idea behind micro warehousing is pretty straightforward. It's the idea that if we want to treat our stores as fulfillment hubs or nodes in our network, then we have to have a good understanding of our back of house and our front of house inventory. There's a lot of ways you can think about it. You can put them on site in the store itself called co-location, or you can put them nearby in a small facility. You can also decide to put the latest and greatest of innovation tech into the building. Here's Alert Innovation, which was just acquired by Walmart. I believe they're a Boston company, if I'm not mistaken. And then you can also just run them with manual human labor too, as evidenced by the instant delivery company at the bottom there, Joker. At the end of the day though, the goal, no matter how you try to stand up these operations is the same. The idea is that you wanna lower your human labor costs over time, you wanna lower your picking and packing costs, and oh, by the way, you also wanna save on your delivery costs because you're placing these facilities closer to the consumer from a last mile standpoint as well. Now, for my money, I don't have all the answers of how to think about this. I'm not a micro warehousing expert, but if I was thinking about it, these are the questions that would be going through my head as an executive. Do I have enough e-commerce demand in the locations where I'm thinking about placing one? Two, can I get the right location? Is the cost of real estate work for me? Can I extrapolate the last mile savings given the, the, the demand I'm theorizing? And then last but not least, how much automation should I put in the building too? I got good advice early in my career. Um, mentor of mine said, Chris, Human labor is always going to be cheaper than a autom uh, high-tech automation system that you have to pull out of your box. So use human labor until you absolutely know what processes you're trying to optimize, and then and only then should you be putting in the latest and greatest in automation tech, which I think is great advice. To that point, though, once you, figure, once you have all that figured out and you know what you want to build, then I highly advocate the co-location approach because it's what gives you the best return on assets and, and that's because the inventory is already placed in the stores for which you're operating these warehouses. All right, that's back of house. Unfortunately, as a retailer, we don't just pick from the back of house anymore either. We also pick from the front of house, either with our own staff or with third party pickers in our store. And so we also have to have a good understanding of the front of house inventory. And that's where RFID comes into play. And so this, this headline is about Walmart's recommitment to RFID earlier this year. Walmart announced, I think back in February or January, that they were mandating that all home furnishing suppliers put RFID tags on their products by September 2nd of 2022. And the reason Walmart did that is because Walmart gets the punchline to the joke that inventory accuracy across the board in retail in stores is honest to God, for lack of a better way to put it, atrocious. Studies show that only, that studies show that inventory accuracy in store is no better than 60 to 70 percent. Contrast that with how a warehouse operates, it's usually in the mid to high 90s. Very, very different. So what that implies is that you can have the best of the best cloud systems working, cloud point of sale, order management systems, those things can be tied together to a T. You can have the best of the best automation running your back of house warehouse. You can have all the various options displayed like you see here on your product detail page, giving your customer anything they could want. But at the end of the day, if you don't know what inventory is in your front of house, it's still gonna lead to broken promises, what I call our broken promises. And those promises can come in a number of forms. It can come in the form of you as a retailer, not having the confidence of knowing what inventory you should be offering up on those product detail pages, because you're just not confident about it. 
Two, it can come in the form of late, uh, late canceled orders after an e-commerce order has been placed, which no one likes. I'm sure we've all had that happen. And then even worse, and this happened to a friend of mine, it can come in the form of going to the store to pick up your $300 curbside pickup order only to find that 20% of it was actually available. True story, my friend tells me about it every single week. He doesn't let me hear the end of it. The best example of where RFID is actually improving how a retail operation works is found overseas in Zara. Zara launched a new flagship store this past April. I had the chance to go visit it in June uh, and we shot a video of it. It's on YouTube if you guys want to check it out. It's probably my favorite piece of content we've ever put out because, hey, it was Madrid and Spain and in the middle of the summer. It was awesome. Um, but honestly, it's the best, barring one other exception, exception, which I'll talk about later, it's probably the best omnichannel retailing experience that I've seen, um, particularly in apparel. It's the best apparel experience I've seen so far. There are a number of innovations I'd call your attention to, the first one of which is scan pay go in an apparel environment which is pretty unique the way this works i take out my mobile phone i scan a barcode i walk over to a pay station i take the security tags off and then i package it up and i just walk out the store which if you've ever been to azara on a weekend is a pretty big deal because it saves you a ton of time the lines there are really long it probably saves you 20 to 40 minutes on average the other place where rfid is really palpable is in the fitting room design this is, how this, wor this is how that works. So this woman, I watched her shop. She has her garments. She places them up against this reader here. It tells her how many garments she has. It then assigns her a fitting room. And the beauty of that for Zara is Zara then knows exactly how many items she's bringing into the fitting room with her, and most importantly, how many she's taking out and how many she's leaving behind. There's a tremendous amount of value that that data provides from a whole host of things, from markdown cadences to fit of garments, et cetera. And then last but not least, it also has this thing called a parcel robot. And what that is, is it's an automated retrieval device for buy online, pick up and store orders. So it works very similarly. You take out your mobile phone, you order whatever you want for buy online, pick up and store. I actually did it from the United States and then picked it up in, from this robot in the store. It was pretty damn impressive. But it works the same way. I show my barcode and the package comes out to me like in seconds, like it's that fast. And at first I thought it was a really gimmicky idea, but then I tried it and I saw people using it and there were so many people using it that I couldn't even shoot the video. Like, and I couldn't even like stand in front of it long enough to talk because somebody would come and want to get their order. Uh, and if you think about it, it has a number of advantages for Zara because one, you create a good buy online pickup and store experience, you're gonna have to ship less products, right? From the customer side, you don't have to wait in line. Zara doesn't have to staff the line for pickup either. But then the other point about it that was really interesting to me is you watch the customers come in and use it. They were also doing something else that was really interesting. They deboxed the products right then and there in the store. They'd try them on, and then if they didn't like them, they'd return it. So it also defrays the reverse logistics costs that come with e-commerce as well. All right, so RFID is not the only way to improve your omnichannel experience, though. The technology, the single technology that I actually predict is gonna impact retail more than any other, which is applicable to the conversations we're having here tonight too, and what Silk does as well, is computer vision. Um, computer vision is gonna shape retail more than anything else in the next five to 10 years, both on the digital side, but particularly in store as well. There's a number of ways you can deploy it. I'm gonna go through those right now, but the one that I picked out particularly is the use case of computer vision by way of robotics in store. And that's captured here by Schnooks. How many of you guys know uh, Schnooks Market, just out of curiosity, in Boston? Okay, good. I had a feeling it was going to be many. Well, Schnooks is like a, it's a local grocer out of St. Louis. Uh, it has about 100 stores. And honest to God, it's one of the best local grocers around. Pound for pound, they know how to do grocery. Uh, and so you can believe me when I tell you this, that they're not going to take the deployment of robots roaming the aisles in their stores lightly. Midwestern grocers are going to take that very seriously. But that's exactly what they did. So about two years ago, they began piloting and testing the use of computer vision and robotics in their stores to track inventory counts, inventory placement on shelves, i.e. is it in the correct spot, and then also pricing accuracy. Like, do they have the right price tags on the products? Are they promoted right? Are they reg priced right? And then last fall, after that successful pilot, they rolled the robots out to every single store. Again, they have robots operating in over 100 stores. 
You can also put computer vision in the ceiling by way of fixed position cameras. This is a shot of the SIBO Express in the Newark airport, which is run, on, run by Amazon's Just Walk Out technology. See you smiling there. And then the other thing you can do is you can put uh, computer vision in the palm of your employees or the third party services that are working your store's hands as well. The way that works is quite simply, you hold up a mobile device to a section of product. There's an AR overlay and that AR overlay will inform you of what products correctly placed, what the counts are and what items are priced correctly and incorrectly as well. Now for my money, I like the robotics use case the most right now in the here and now for a couple of reasons. They're all, all three of those options are gonna give you better inventory and uh, pricing accuracy, that's a given. Um, they're also gonna give you better customer experience for the reasons I've talked about already. You're gonna have better available to promise because when you have more confidence in the inventory on your shelves, you can better offer that up as we talked about before. The other point too though is it's gonna give you better in-store navigation. So many of our customers now are using wayfinding apps that having a real-time understanding of where products actually located in your store makes that experience better too. But the last reasons that I like them, robots over the other, other options are, they're easier to implement. The fixed position cameras are quite a capital intensive undertaking. Robots, you could call a company up tomorrow and get one in your store pretty quickly and start experimenting with it. And the other thing too, and this is particularly from the retail operator side of me, is a robot does things the same way every time. You put computer vision in the hands of your employees, you have to remember retail is a high turnover job. You're constantly having to retrain, rehire those people and teach them on how to do that effectively each and every day. So that becomes an inherently subjective process. Robotics not, it's totally objective. They come in the same way, every store, every day, the same way, it creates an exception management process that's easy to follow. All right. The one technology actually that I think is going to have its day in the sun here, particularly when you look at the combination of it with computer vision, is the use of electronic shelf labels. And that's evidenced by Walmart's headline here that they announced they plan to uh, expand the use of them very soon. The traditional use cases for electronic shelf labels were pretty cut and dry, and they weren't enough to put it over the edge. And they were as follows. You had pricing accuracy. This is a great photo, by the way. That's a real photo. That's pretty funny. Um, you know, they're, they're designed to avoid that situation. Right? <laughs> uh, the, of course, the labor savings, which if you've ever done this job on a Sunday, uh, when you set a big circular, is the worst job in human history. Um, but despite those two use cases, which you think are pretty straightforward, better pricing, less labor, it wasn't enough to push it over the edge. But now there are other use cases that are starting to emerge. The first is what I call mark-to-market pricing. Um, and by that I mean Electronic shelf labels enable retailers to control their pricing and keep them calibrated to what is happening in the online space much more easily, especially when you combine it with computer vision, which can monitor those prices on shelves as well. And then lastly, the other thing that's pushing them over the edge is there's a lot of gains that are happening on the efficiency side of things, particularly with restocking and picking. And that's happening from a capability called pick to light, where the electronic shelf labels will light up indicating for the stockers or the pickers where they should go to collect the inventory that they need to either put back on the shelf or take off, the, take off of the shelf for an order. All right, I teased it before. Here it is. I won't keep you guys in suspense anymore. But it's my contention that Amazon's, Amazon Go or Amazon's Just Walk Out technology, to be more correct, is already the next great innovation in retail. And the reason for that is simply, if you look at everything we've talked about today, going back from headline number 10 all the way down to headline number two, all of that is working in on display in an Amazon store that deploys this technology. For example, cameras in the ceiling, monitoring inventory at all times. This is their latest suburban format in, in Washington, Amazon Go. It's 6,000 square feet, 3,000 of which is back of house space, which could easily be turned into a micro warehouse at any point in time. They, of course, have electronic shelf labels on shelf as well, which means they can be marked to market with their e-commerce pricing very easily. And more importantly, they can change the prices more quickly than a traditional retailer or competitive retailer that's still using print jobs to change their price signs. But the most important thing about the platform is that Amazon has, through computer vision, a real-time understanding of everything we as consumers do in and around products in space. Or said another way, 
Amazon is for the first time digitizing our understanding of the physical world in much the same way we understand how a mouse moves across a desktop browser. So I hinted at it before in the opening, but in essence, Amazon is giving us the first personalized physical store through this technology. And you combine that understanding of how we shop in store as consumers, you combine that with a content network that can serve us up content at the moment of inspiration and take us to purchase in second while we're all plugged in, millions of people each and every week to football or whatever else. And that whole situation makes Amazon incredibly powerful to meet the needs of omnichannel commerce, not just for today's consumer, but for tomorrow's consumer as well. All right, that closes us up.